it's Manny. I'm at Manny's Mic Locker in my own recording studio. Uh, that was the new single by Lemo called Other Side. We tracked that, mixed it, engineered it, did everything fully at my studio here in Los Angeles. And we had it mastered by Bob Weston out of Chicago Mastering Service. That's currently available if you want to check it out on Spotify. If you want to find Michael Lemo, you can look him up on Instagram. A lot, I knew Michael as an artist, but a lot of people may know him as one of... Uh, one of the cats over at Norm's Rare Guitars, which is the wicked guitar store in Los Angeles that has some of the rarest cool guitars and some of the greatest guitar players always stop by. See if you can check out Norm's Rare Guitars. You can see Lemo play there every day. And lastly, Audioscape. And what brought me to even this crossroads is that almost everything we used was Audioscape's gear. I've got a f racks of it now. And I remember back in 2007 or 8, I was at a studio in Honolulu called The Rainforest Room with Dimitri Marmash. And I remember seeing all this boutique gear, and I was like, what the heck is this gear? And it sounds amazing. And he's like, oh, you got to go online to try to buy it. I think for a year, I kept on trying to go on their Sundays or Wednesdays to buy whatever they would be selling, and I never got that piece of gear. And now, there's, they're a bigger company now where you can definitely have a shorter wait list to buy your thing. So I've got some really cool stuff. I got an AS78. Uh, stereo limiter. I have a 7060 mono uh, compressor. I have a uh, spring reverb called an XL305R. I have the V comp, which is, just melts audio. And then I got an Opticomp, which is like a classic LA 2A vocals, anything. On this session, Jimmy DeAnda was the drummer. Orion was on bass. On Jimmy, his 67s, I ran to the AS78 just slightly giving them a little bit of harmonics. On Lemo's guitars, we used the AS78, the 7060, and the V3As on the guitar. On the bass guitar, we used the Opticomp. When we re the bass guitar, I ran it through this weird pedal. We used the V-Comp for that. Lemo's vocals were the 7060 and the Opticomp. And when we're mixing it, I use some of the reverb on the guitar of the XL304R, which is a stereo standalone reverb unit by Audioscape. So, as you can tell, I'm a huge fan, but it's part of the tools of the trade. Like a guy with a camera taking that snapshot, trying to get the good lighting. I do the same thing with mic placement, trying to get the sound, trying to capture lightning in a bottle. If you're that kind of producer, and I'm not one of those guys that have recently bombarded with telling you about plugins that are going to save you and thumb drums and making your music sound like a cartoon, you can still do that. But this is strictly about engineering, tracking a band, having hardware, and yeah, I have a computer system that has plugins in it, but I use those just to do the final stages. Most of the sound was committed through the mics, the artist, and Audioscape, and then myself in my ears. All right, well, if you're mixing, if you don't know what Topo Chico is, look it up as well. Let's get to mixing, and I'm going to enjoy some Topo Chico. All right, now to the fun stuff. Once again, this is Lemo. This is a mixed breakdown of a song called Other Side. Let's start with just checking out the track a little bit, and then I'll go through what you'll hear on the drums and what I used, and basically the most minimalism to get great sounds. So here's the track. That little bit of reverb here is the live auxiliary of the Audioscape. So, the drums. It's kind of a elaborate setup. Uh, on the kick drum, we had a um, company called United. Uh, they make a great FET 47, in the spirit of a FET 47. And we had that on kick. On the inside of the kick drum, I had a SM98. The snare was a, um, a Unidyne 56, which is like Van Halen era, kind of like a 57, but of back in the day. Underneath the snare, I had a Peluso P414. The toms were Lawton 308s. The ride and the and the hi-hats were mic'd with these 60 mics that I love. They're my favorite dynamics called AKG uh, D 
224Es. They have two elements in them, wicked microphones. And then the overheads were Warm Audio 67s. That is correct. That is what I said. I did this, like a demo of a lot of warm mics, and I used their uh, 67s kind of in Bonzo Led Zeppelin style. And I had a pair of AKG C12As, which are phenomenal mics. And I remember getting this 3D image that I loved about them, and I got the same thing out of the U67s for warm. So I have a pair of warms that I use on almost every session. I know, I know. You're just gonna have to go out and buy a pair to really try them. So here, if I break down the drums, here is just the warm 67s, and I ran them into the 1178 as a pair, committed them just a little bit, like maybe one dB of processing, and I'll let you hear that with uh, the kick drum. And I've added the snare and the beater side. That's only the 267 setup Led Zeppelin style. So that's the kick drum. I do put a mic hanging over the beater, and that's that snap that you hear. If I don't use an EQ, I use a mic. That mic is literally just hanging down above the beater. So like everything we were talking about on minimalism and committing, the drums are tuned. It's a great drummer. I've taken a lot of time to make sure my mics are set up the way I want them. I've um, exploited some mics more than others. Some of them are just blended in. My mic selection has a lot to do with the 3D image of the drums. The Lawton Toms, the Warm 67s are mind-blowing. The United Kick is just massive. So. When I look at the drums, the only thing I really wanted was reverb, and like I said, I put reverb on the snares, uh, top and bottom, and that was a, an EMT plate. It's one of my favorite. Look up the drums of a song called Rock Candy by Montrose with Sammy Hagar singing. Rock Candy are my favorite drums, so these drums are a little bit like Sunset Sound, Rock Candy drums. That won't make sense unless you hear that song, so check it out. And like I said, I have one EQ, which is just cutting a little bit on the hi-hat. I have a delay that's delaying the room. So the, and my rooms are, which are just over here, you can't see them. There's, the mics sit on a piece of plywood and they're on the floor. My room has carpet. But I wanted the drum sounds to, as the drummer plays so loud, I wanted the sound to hit the, uh, the wood and then go into these Omni microphones. The Mojave MA37 is a, is a, in the spirit of a Sony C37, that's set to Omni. That's right on the floor. So if you look at the kick drum, my room mics are about a foot and a half or two feet out in front of it. And both mics are facing just outside the outer edge of the kick drum. So like this mic is almost facing the bottom of the snare, the rock tom. This mic is almost looking at the floor tom underneath the ride. And they're on the floor and they're omnis and I put these gobos around them. So I'm, oh, I'm just trying to get a picture of the floor. And the reason I'm even slipping them back in time, I could put the mics out farther in the room. I feel like when I move the mics farther away, the sound isn't really enhanced as much. When I keep the mic close to the kit, it sounds thick and huge. And then when I delay it digitally using digital, it gives me some distance on them. So I can get this intense sound and move it a little bit back in time. And it sounds really great with the drums. So I'll let you hear the drums without the room mics and then I'll add them.
It's just a little bit of hair on the edges. I really love it. And once again, it's blendable, it's mixable. Maybe you're like, oh, I don't really like that. Then I'll just put them lower. If you were mixing this, you can put them lower. I didn't, and I, I have them kind of like, fuck it. Why not? Um, have the audio police come arrest me, <laughs> you know? Um, so those are the drums. You can see my screen. There's really nothing going on except I'm busting them over, doing a mix to them. Part of the meanness of this track was a synthesizer that I recorded with Lemo. It's Electro Harmonics, a mini synth. I had done a, a video a while ago doing a song off the Fair Warning record called One Foot Out the Door. It's an amazing, it's like a toy. It's a toy synth, has a, doesn't even have a keyboard. You just have to move your fingers like you slide them around on the keyboard. Lemo played that and a lot of that sound dictated how vicious the recording was gonna be. So And because it's not polyphonic, it's not gonna do a bunch of chords, you have to play the rhythm that you're doing in it. So he put his own pulse on that. And to, something I didn't mention, this song was initially cut with a drum machine, Lemo playing guitars on it, putting that synth over the drum machine, even singing over the drum machine. And that's how we started. So when Jimmy came in to play drums, it was so important that Jimmy locked into the not only the drum machine, but locked in like to the cadence and the groove that Lemo put down. And I think that's the part when we talk about, yeah, all the plugins in the world cannot make that. You can go in there and try to edit it, do something with that, but the human feel and the human groove is why I think this song really smokes. So now Ryan came in and played some bass, and so I'm gonna play it with, you hear the drums, the synth, and now Ryan's bass with it. Uh, the bass ran through Optocomp compressor by Autoscape, and the synthesizer ran through the V-Comp when I recorded that, but that was DI V-Comp printed. And once again, I'll let you hear that sound on its own. And I don't have any plugins on it. We committed, that was the raunchy sound. Now when we got to Ryan's bass and I'm running them on the DI, once again, because we committed to the compression, the amp, the microphone selection, and my preamps, just so you know that there's no smoking mirrors here, almost everything I have is old Brent Averill, which is also considered BAE, but it's before BAE became what people would think of the modern BAE. This is what I have, one of my main BAEs, it's a DMP. Uh, I think it's like a 1073. I've had this. This probably came out in early 2000s. Uh, one of my favorite uh, preamps. This Brent Abril is a, is a rack unit that has one API 312 in it, but this is probably late 90s. My rack consists of four MA5s, which is made by Avidas, which he worked at Brent Abril, came through the Brent Abril world. So that's Avidas, or the kicks and the snares. The toms are Cytex, which are Neotex. Um, they don't make these anymore, but if you can find Cytex, it's a beautiful one rack with four preamps in it. And then I have um, three other Brent Averills, which are once again, not the modern BAE ones, but they would be Brent Averill, which is Brent Averill Enterprises, BAE. So we got the synths and the bass going on. <laughs> And then remember, what you're hearing is nothing on my master bus. I have, uh... 
But you can see that it's totally slamming, but hey, sounds good. Like I said, no one's breaking down my door to arrest me for this. I'm breaking the law here. Um, all right, so now we're on to Lemo's guitars. The challenge of that was when he came in, he put his amp up, and I don't know where he got this. I thought he, I've recorded him for probably the last five or six years, and he has this twin that is just outstanding. When he brought this twin in, he plugged into it, and it literally shook the whole building I'm in. And I was kind of like, what the hell is going on? And he goes, oh, that's not my original. This is a new one that they found at the guitar store that he works at, Norm's Rare Guitars. And his, um, one of the techs or the guys over there recommended these speakers to put in it. I will get a picture of those speakers, and hopefully I'll have them by the time this video comes out. But it sounded incredible. So when he played this riff over the drum machine, all I'm hearing is him riffing and the drum machine as he laid the song down. And this is the guitar sound that you're going to hear uh, as he starts rocking. <laughs> So only hearing the drum machine before we even put the drums down and just hearing Lemo play the guitars, it was outrageous. His guitar setup is that, once again, that example of the engineer could be like, screw it, put the 57 on it, it's fine. I symbolically did do that because I had that Unidyne 56, which would have been from the Van Halen 1 era, and I put that on his rig. But... I wanted to use ribbon mics, and one of my favorite ribbon mics is a BK-5 and an also a Russian um, Octava 19, which is kind of a copy of a BK-5. What is a BK-5? It's a 1950s ribbon of recent, I would say, made more, more, most famous by um, Super Unknown by Soundgarden. That whole record is it's a BK-5 and probably a 421 or a 57. All the guitars were done that, and a BK-5 is an outstanding mic. So I have a 50s BK-5, and then I put the Unidyne 56 next to it on one speaker. I listen back, and I'm like, well, you know, I love condensers. I put a United Twin 87, which is two 87s in one. It's a new mic, once again, made in the spirit of an 87. But they give you an option to go vintage or modern. The modern would have more top end. The vintage would be a little bit darker. So I put the 287 on the other speaker. And then I'm like, God, but I want to use my 1950s Alt-Tech Salt Shaker, which is called a 633A. Ross Robinson, who's done all the corn records and all that stuff, his engineer uses those, uses those all the time. My friend Thomas Scriven at Analogger was the first guy to turn me on to those. And I had to put that on it. So now I've got four mics on the small little twin. Here is the BK-5. <laughs> that reverb here is coming off his amp as well. He's committed to the pedal. So that's the BK-5 running into the AS78, one of the channels. Now I'm going to play you the Unidyne 56, same thing going into AS78, committed his sounds and pedals. <laughs> Now here is the Twin 87. This is the next speaker. This is running into a Audioscape 76D. All right, so the last microphone on the other speaker is going to be the 1950s Alt-Tech Salt Shaker 633. A. Hey.
So as I run through these, you can really hear the characters of each mic, and that's going to be the magic blend later. So now, lastly, the Radio Shack, a realistic, cheap mic you can find on eBay. It's called a um, 1070, I believe. Um, and this is on the ceiling right above the amp. Um, the microphone stand is literally next to the amp, pointing straight up to the ceiling. <laughs> What I love about that mic, there's just not a lot of BS in it. It has low end, but it's not like super subby. It just has a lot of character. Now I want you to hear this, the guitars come in one at a time. I'll just go like a one, two, run the garden, and you'll hear them all come in. I'll start with the BK5, 56, 287, Salt Shaker, and then the room mic. And that's five mics on the guitars. <laughs> So now that those guitars are massive, and that's a massive setup running through all the audioscape stuff, up above them, there is no plugins. So I'm just doing a gain stage, and I didn't have to make them loud, because he was effing loud. I have loud drums now. Now I've got really loud guitars that were shaking the building. So I'm gonna add the drums with that, and now you can hear the blend of all the mics and the drums. <laughs> Now for mixing purposes, I had, I set up an auxiliary, so while I'm mixing, even right now while I'm playing, you're gonna hear a reverb come on the other side with the room mic that I have panned. That is just strictly, uh, I'm sending uh, the guitars in a blend over to the um, Autoscape XL305R, a standalone reverb unit, which is right below me. It's on right now, it's working, it's the same settings I had on this mix. I'm going to add that to the mix. Add some bass guitar and some synths. We're building something. Now we had some overdubs on his guitars. All these overdubs went through, because they were in pairs of a room mic and the guitar mic went to the AS78. Here is one of the overdubs that happens early in the song and I'll just solo that by itself. On the actual track, I don't have anything on it. So we committed, I think these guitars has reverb from a amp. And at the time I probably put a little bit of the um, XL305 committing while we were doing it. So those are just harmonics, and that's his, that's one of his overdubs that happens, I think, every time he does that. So then now, um, we have some other guitar overdubs that are going to come in later in the song, but then let's get to the vocals. 
Now, when we cut these vocals, we, when we came in approaching the song, we were really relaxed. And Lemo sang it the first time, sitting on the couch back there. I have this old mic called the Frank Sinatra mic, which is 60s, AKG D24, which is, I think there's a, a few records of Frank Sinatra singing, and he has it in his hand, so they call it the Frank Sinatra mic. But the internals are Ringo Starr's D19. So they're the same internals that the Beatles would have used all over the Beatles records. Except this one kind of has like a 58 style uh, bulb on the top and it works really good for singing. So Lemo's sitting on the couch behind me. I ran his vocals into the Autoscape 76D and then the Opticom and he's just literally sitting back there. He had no headphones. I played what came off these speakers and probably about seven feet back he just sang in the mic and that's our vocal take. Of all the things that we did, this is the case and scenario where you see more plugins because I really had to deal with that. Him just singing back there, we didn't care, but we loved the performance so much. And thanks, thankfully and gratefully, I know how to work around some plugins. And that was one where even though we tracked it with Audioscape, it needed some love later. So here's Lemo's vocals with the song. I want to know you, my supernova. The sun is shining, but I'm standing on the other side Right where you left me, life is so heavy Sometimes I wonder if I'm heading for the other side So these vocals are being slammed. My little thing to use on that is I use this delay, which is kind of like a copy of an analog delay. I love it, and if you notice, I put the output, output super high. The wetness is barely up. It's got like a few milliseconds of delay on it. I have an API EQ where I'm pumping some of the upper frequencies. Sometimes I do a lot of low end cuts, but since this is a 60s kind of Beatle mic, that was the beauty of them. They already had their little cut and they had their little notch cut out of the vocal, so I didn't have to do a lot of EQing on it. And then I have, a, I have an LA-2A, which is Waves barely working, and then I got 1176 or a CLA 76. I wanna know ya, my supernova. The sun is shining, but I'm standing on the other side, right where you left me. So you can see when he went, you know, you saw the um, plug-in totally slam, like, well, that's why I used it. I wanted to kind of, do what I did initially on the tracking, which was nice, but as I put his vocals super loud, it just enhanced some of those things of having a live mic and a live performance. So I'm using technology to help me out, but also I'm still using the analog sense. When I put it all together, I felt it needed a hair more, and one of my favorite ones is the Decapitator by Sound Toys. Um, I'll let you hear it with it and without it. I want to know ya, my supernova The sun is shining but I'm standing on the other side Right where you left me, life is so heavy You can hear when I put the decapitator in it just add a little bit of top in and kind of thinned out some of the woofiness of it At least that's what it sounds like on my speakers And I really love it, it just really And that's that thing of when people talk about mixing and I could spend all day like throwing up all these EQs and cutting this and doing that. Doesn't really matter, honestly, man. You gotta play the vocals with the track and see if all these little things that you're doing sound good. So here's the track. I put all the whistles and bells on them, a way process more than any of the instruments. And I have to make sure he really sounds cool over the music. I wanna know you, my supernova. So one of the cool things I do with vocals is I'll duplicate them three times and I'll slip digitally the two other vocals out of time. I can slip the wave files, sometimes I print them and I slip the delays back with the same delay I showed you on the room mics. So here's the vocal and I'm going to play you the main vocal and then I'll add in the right and then I'll add in the left. So instead of using some kind of like stereo uh, delay or some kind of stereo unit, I physically split the vocals 
made three vocal tracks, which is fat and huge sounding, and then I've out of time, and I mess around with that until they sound right, and that's slipping the files, whatever I have to do to make them sound cool, to make it sound like an old Bowie record. So here's one vocal, and then I'll go two, and then three, adding in the left and then the right. I wanna know ya, my supernova The sun is shining but I'm standing on the other side Right where you left me, life is so heavy Sometimes I wonder if I'm heading for the other side I mean that's massive on my speaker so he's competing with all these drums and all these loud instruments and then it works So now you hear the cacophony and the anarchy, and I'm basically, it's like building the pyramids. I have these big blocks of sound. I'm just heavily just throwing them into the mix. And my Pro Tool system has really nothing on it. And that's the thing that I think is a little bit of rarity in these day and ages. If you go and listen to Brendan O'Brien or you listen to, um, um, Nigel, the guy that does all the Radiohead records, they track a lot. I think Ben and O'Brien could probably bring in tapes of Rage or Stone Temple Pilots, throw them on a deck, put everything at zero, hit play, and you're going to hear that radio song good to go. It's a th crazy way to approach it. And when I was growing up, those are the cats that I want it to be like. So as I start to process my sound using my influence of Steve Albini that he showed me, to Dave Sardi, then we talk um, Nick Linnae and uh, Nigel, to um, Rich Costi, uh, mixing, all those people, I love what they do. A lot of the stuff is organic, a lot of the stuff is committal. I think Rich Costi travels around with the BCM 10 console so he can get that Neve sound. I love that. All right, so now we're into the whistle and the bells of it. So we've established these big drums. We don't have the drum machine anymore. We've got cool bass. Orion's came in and smoked the beginning and the end. Lemo already killed the vocals track, and then he has those mean guitars that were shaking the whole room. So we wanted to add a few things that were kind of countering his guitars. This is a synthesizer running into, um, into his amp, which had reverb. I have a ring modulator on it, and then that's also running to, right now, in the auxiliary send of the Audioscape XL305R. So here's that synth sound. <laughs> so you can hear it, but in the track, it's a little bit more subliminal. I'm on the other side Been waiting my whole life Just a little, you know, answer and call to his harmonic, and we added the synth to do that. That was Lemo playing that. All right, now the fun stuff. So Lemo already established a solo that he's going to be doing, and... This is what he did during the take, and this is a solo that he committed to that we loved. Obviously that tag you hear is the Autoscape 308. So then he did, and just for you know shits and giggles, I'm like, why don't we double that and see what we can do? So he doubled it. I got that solo, flipped it in reverse, and then this way, when before his actual solo starts, you're gonna hear the swell 
up on the left side. It's kind of like swells up and then his solo comes in and they're both doubling. And at that point, I felt like it set up a way cool image of the solo. So here's the backwards guitar by itself and then I'll play it where uh, it comes in with the track. Now here's his main guitar that he cut live with the main guitar heavy riff. And now you're gonna hear this come in and that's where the image changed. When I'm mixing it, I wanted something to happen on the solo and it was just the perfect storm. <laughs> because I have the reverb and it's stereo, when you hear sounds ping-ponging off, I just have that guitar only sending to the right side of the reverb. And there's other overdubs that come out on the right side that I have only sending to the left side of the reverb. So during certain points of the songs, you're gonna hear things stomp and end, and you'll hear a tail here, and then you hear the real amp tail here. That's what I love about, you know, mixing it raw dog, having it be cool, and your building blocks are way more solid. So Lemo laid down that solo, it was really beautiful. Towards the end of the song, he does have two of the parts that happen. Here's one of them. Lemo loves green and he loves Godzilla and that's his Godzilla scream. I don't know if anyone ever would realize that, but when he did that, I was like, dude, he just did Godzilla scream in there, you know? So that is working with his main guitar. So here's that overdub with his main guitar. And, and I do have that also going into the reverb. mine because it was fun doing it and it's fun listening to it all right so now we're winding down that during the solo one of the biggest challenges also lemo does have dialogue to the solo and he kind of does this iggy pop kind of like uh saying the certain words to the song so as much as everything is on 11 i had to make room for the vocals so that is the also challenge is if you really have to set up everything in your mix so you have room to put things in. So you're going to hear his voice come in during the solo and that's what he sang when he tracked it and I thought it was so cool. I definitely love the kind of China Girl, David, when I say China Girl, even though everybody knows David Bowie did it, originally that was Iggy Pop that sang that song, China Girl. And I felt like he sang it a little bit more like Iggy. Oh.
right, so now we've got his vocal set up pretty cool going to the solo. And these were some overdubs are gonna start to come in. I thought you hear the like the chur 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 chur, you know, that one that is one guitar. So there's two guitars kind of countering a melody at the very end. Here's one of them. So that guitar is gonna be now blended in with those other guitars that are overdubbing. So here's those guitars coming in with everything and this is the ending kind of epic part that's gonna be now setting up the last overdub which is Orion playing this really bitchin' bass run. I mean, that's so cool. So that was that was the last thing that we did in overdubs, and Ryan just had a great idea. What if he used my, he had some kind of flanger or phaser, and that with the ring modulator made it sound so cool. So uh, once again, this is a reamp of his original bass, now running into some guitar pedals, into a mini brute. I mic'd it up, and then we committed to it. And that's kind of it. So putting it all together. And one other thing that Jimmy did that was pretty spectacular is that he played this drum fill. And I mentioned to him, well, I love the drums that sound kind of like Alice in Chains. I don't remember the name of the Alice in Chains songs. But the things where he's playing, he did this as kind of like the, it's like a lazy tom. And Jimmy just knocked it out of the ballpark. So when you hear the end of the song and you hear these toms happening, that is an overdub. That's him playing the beat and then hitting the toms while he's doing it, which is a crazy thing to ask a drummer. And then like Orion on the ending, playing that, arp, that really fast bass run with that drum part really brought that element of what and play with you. Because if Lemo and I would have left the, the drum machine and never would have reached that level where those musicians had enhanced our recording and we couldn't have done it without them. So I think that's the biggest lesson also. So here we go, this is the end of the song, and we're gonna be wrapping this up. That's the limo song, that's the mix down. And once again, looking at my, um, my setup here, there's not a lot going on. If you can see, I've got the reverbs on the snare, time delays on the brooms, nothing on the bass, nothing on the guitar, nothing on the synths. I have them also being bused to Audioscape's XL305R in a bus, so I have these reverbs that are sending left and right because it's a stereo unit. Only on the vocals, I did a little bit more than you can even say normal now, what you would do. And then on the master bus, we just have a, a Joseph, Jack Joseph Puig, um Fairchild on it. Super simple. I knew we were gonna master this. 
And like I said, I didn't let my ego get ahead of me. So when I heard the track, I knew it didn't sound as good as my first demo. And I went back to the first demo. There isn't even a note in here. If you look at the top of my Pro Tools session, it says Lemo, Manny. Uh, oh, I put AS Breakdown. I already changed it. Son of a gun. Prior to that, it put OG template because I brought in my original rough and I wanted to know why this sounded bigger than my all whistles and bells plug-in. I put my ego aside and realized that because we committed so much to the sounds, I was able to get away with having the most minimal amount of plugins and get the most massive amount of audio out of this. We sent it to Bob Weston in Chicago. He's one of the best and he really killed it and knocked it out of the park. So my worrying of the master um, fader not having all these things I need for EQs and stuff, I said, you know, we're getting it mastered. He'll figure it out. If it's too big, too small, needs some upper frequencies, I sent him the wave files with room to do that. And um, that's the mix for uh, Lemo. Other side, thank you, Audioscape. Thanks for checking it out. I hope there was something in there that you learned. Definitely like it. Definitely send me a message. You can find me at Manny's Mic Locker, YouTube and Instagram. You can find Lemo, YouTube and Instagram at Norm's Red Guitars and Audioscape is everywhere. Definitely go to Audioscape's uh, website. You can only buy from them direct. Their prices are incredible. And like I said, proof's in the pudding. That's a real song, real band, real musicians. I made that mix. Adios.